approach polytheism this afternoon. Uh, many of you know who I am, but, uh, but for those who don't, um, I am the founder of uh, Tauta Galation. Um, I am the author of uh, Ancient Fire, an Introduction to Gaulish Polytheism. Uh, I uh, am a co-admin of the uh, Gaulish Polytheism group on uh, Facebook. Um, I've been exploring pagan paths since 1978. Uh, first was initiated into an eclectic Wiccan coven back in 1984. Uh, I had started meeting with them in late 1983. I'd actually had my first social meeting with a couple of the members at uh, Town Square Mall in downtown St. Paul, Minnesota in 1981, but I was too young and they told me to come back when I was 18. Um, when I came back and got introduced to them, that's a whole story in and of itself. Um, I uh, started practicing Celtic traditions of various kinds in 1985, uh, practiced what we would call Gaulish or Gaelic polytheism, Irish polytheism, starting in the late 1980s, started practicing something like Gaulish polytheism around 1990, 91, uh, didn't really begin practicing it heavily because I didn't have research materials available in, in English. Uh, and so I didn't start doing that until after the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, that was when we started studying online Gaulish a little bit more. And uh, that, was, that was available for the first time at that point. You, you didn't have, you, otherwise, you pretty much had to be in a linguistics department to study it. Um, so I've been practicing with Gaulish polytheism as my almost exclusive, uh, not totally exclusive, but almost exclusive uh, spiritual path since about 2008, 2009. Uh, and uh, uh, it's been uh, more than 10 years now. Uh, so that's, those are my credentials. Uh, today's class is going to be um, very raw basic. I, I intended it to be, to be raw basic. It's, it's going to cover the skeleton of the worldview, not, not all of the worldview. It's going to cover uh, the deities that I have over the years found most significant. Uh, it's, it's going to cover a couple of classes of spirit. Uh, it is not going to cover sanctuaries or rituals. It's not going to cover calendars or holidays. We don't have time for that. Uh, so, uh, so what you're getting is, is the, the, the raw basic skeleton. If you have been practicing a while, or if you have read Ancient Fire, or if you've read my columns on polytheist.com, you're not going to find anything appreciably new here, but it might serve as a good refresher. Um, if uh, you are very new and starting out, you may find this extremely useful. And uh, so with that, let's begin. Next slide, please. Uh, there we go, good. We'll start out with the Gaulish worldview, and we're going to start out with cosmic principles. Built into the Celtic languages and worldviews are two great cosmic principles that exist in a system of complementary duality. Each is needed to complete the cosmos. Neither by itself can support life and wholeness. We have no direct evidence as to whether the Gauls had words for such principles, but linguistic reconstruction suggests, or doesn't suggest, it, it proves that the words existed in Old Common Celtic, so it would be surprising if the words didn't survive into Gaulish. Here I'm using the terms from Alexei Kondratiev's Apple Branch with meanings taken from Kondratiev, the Brothers Rees Celtic heritage, and a touch of intuition. Also, I throw into that uh, uh, Ranko Matasovic's Etymological Dictionary of Old Common Celtic, of Proto-Celtic, I'm sorry, I keep making that mistake every time I rehearse this. 
and uh, also uh, Xavier Del Mar's Dictionnaire de la Langue Galloise. Those two dictionaries are probably my most important sources for the Gaulish worldview. It's mostly a matter of, of uh, inspired linguistic reconstruction. Next slide. So we get to the uh, principles themselves. Samos is the cos cosmic principle of the summer, the light, daytime, the upper world, the living order, the tame, and the mundane. It is. It simply means summer. That's all it means. And it is a cognate with the Irish saura, which also means summer, but it does not denote a cosmic principle of any particular sort. It's it's pretty much just a straight up word for summer. Um, Gyamas is the cosmic principle of the winter, the dark, nighttime, the lower world, the dead, chaos, the wild, and the magical. Now, Gyamas means winter, and it is uh, um, cognate with the Irish Gyaura. So the alternation of these principles in the form of day or night, day and night, or summer and winter, waxing and waning moons, has profound meaning. It is the means by which time and the calendar are generated, and it determines which spiritual influences are dominant at any particular time. To grossly simplify, you will find that uh, magical activities and intuitive activities and storytelling and whatnot are good during the during the uh, nighttime and during the winter. More mundane activities are good during the uh, daytime and during the uh, summer. Next slide, please. Intertwining with, supporting, and supported by the two cosmic principles is the system of three worlds. Now, modern Irish-based Celtic reconstructionists tend to use the three worlds of land, sea, and sky in their practice. They base this on well-founded mainstream scholarship of early Irish cosmology, which finds the belief reflected in the Irish epic, the Toyn Bo Coolinia, as well as various oaths and prayers. There is evidence for this same belief among the Gauls as well, in the form of Strabo's famous quote that the Celts on the Danube feared nothing so much as that the sky might fall on them. They were talking to Alexander the Great, ostensibly. Uh, we can wonder whether that actually happened, but certainly that was... I think a bit of Celtic lore that got embedded in uh, Greek history. Uh, Celtic linguists recognized native words for heaven, earth, or the world, and the deep in the Celtic languages that have similar connotations to land, sea, and sky. These include attested words in Gaulish. The archaeological evidence of Gaulish sacrifice, while ambiguous and of many types, reveal at least two kinds that are most likely two kinds of sacrifice, that is, that are most likely made to celestial and infernal deities. With that in mind, we can sketch the outlines of a cosmic system. Essentially, it consists of sky, this world, and the deep, with the possibility of a world tree linking them, though this last is conjectural. It resembles the system of land, sea, and sky closely, though I see no reason not to use the Gaulish terms for these things, since we have them, and their connotations are different from any words in English. Next slide. Moving on to the system itself, we have Albios, the sky, home of the celestial deities, celestial bodies, with connotations of light, purity, and truth, source of power for the Samos principle. Nemos, sky, another word for Albios above, though perhaps more restricted in meaning to the physical sky. Uh, Nemos literally means heaven or the heavens. It has none of the paradise connotations of the word heaven in English. Um, Bitus, this world, home of humanity, animals, plants, and various spirits, acted upon by the upper and lower worlds. Uh, Bitus is a, world that also, a word that also means world in a generic sense, and Bitus is related to the verb to be, so it has a connotation of that which is. In, in a mundane or physical sense, one might say. Mari is a sea, another word for dumnos below, though definitely more restricted in meaning to the watery sea. Mari is definitely the uh, sea that you can fish in and 
that washes the shore. It, it's definitely the physical sea. But the physical sea ties into the metaphysical sea. Dumnas, the deep, home of the Chthonic deities, spirits of the dead, and certain dark spirits. Connotations of darkness, fertility, and mysterious power. Source of power for the Gyamas principle. Then we have Bilios, a tree, by extension the world tree linking the three worlds. It is conjectural. Um, Xavier Del Mar, who is the leading authority on the Gaulish language in the world today, uh, in a book on um, Gaulish nouns, uh, wrote an article, it, the, the book was a collection of his articles on, on topics related to Gaul, to nouns in Gaulish. And he wrote an article that he included in there, which uh, which I didn't have when I wrote all of this down, um, that I've seen more recently. And he posits the existence of a Gaulish word, drus, D-R-U-S, I believe, or drus, which apparently meant oak tree. It's related to the other Gaulish word for oak, derwas. Um, but, uh, but drus, he believes Drus also represented the world tree and therefore thinks we have strong linguistic evidence for the existence of a world tree belief among the Gauls. And not only that, but that the world tree was specifically an oak. So that's kind of neat. Okay, next slide. Now we talk about words for celestial and chthonic. According to Del Mar, there were also attested words for celestial or Uranian and Chthonic or infernal. This supports our argument that there are three that the three worlds and two cosmic principles were important elements of Gaulish cosmology. There were words for worlds, descriptive terms for things from above and things from below, and differences in ritual in some places and times, all suggesting the centrality of a cosmic system emphasizing the shining heavens, the dark deep, and the world between them, over which they alternated influence. So words involved are Venados, from above, pertaining to Albias, celestial, and Andernados, from Andernados, from below, pertaining to Dumnas, Sonic, Infernal. Uh, note that these are actually, I believe, adjectives. So you could talk de Unwernadoi, which would be the gods above, or the day why undernadoi, which would be the gods below. Could you hear me? When did I, I when when did I fade out? Okay. It was authentic. Can you hear me? Oh, I've got one bar. Good. Okay, next slide. 
Okay, this page is somewhat screwy because this is just concepts related to honor and Vinny's imagination. And I'm going to take these completely out of order as they appear on the page, um, as they appear on the slide. Um, so let's talk about Weiros, the one on the bottom of the slide there. Um, Can you hear me? Okay. Um, th this slide it is really, um, this slide uh, I got it off one of my old calls, and it's this constant honor. Honor. Uh, Okay, you take over. Okay, I forgot to unmute myself at the recording. Um, and and he goes, which is face and honor. Um, see, you can see here that like honor, like because of these vocabulary words right here, that honor, at least in this way, uh, was very important uh, to the goals. And uh, you can see in also, if you're verified on the server, you can go to our uh, Rexus Galatian where we have our interpretation of honor, which, uh, which we use the, the word gala for. Uh, so carrying yourself with that honor is, is something that is, you know, very important to, to Gauls and uh, many Gaulish polytheists kind of try to live that in their, in their practice. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. All right, you're, you're sounding much better now. Okay, go for it. If you wanted to add anything okay. to this Um I just wanted to quick point out there are alternate forms of some of these words. Wiras, which means true, just, and truth, um, can also take the form wiria. I put wiras in printed form because it was what I could cite. In the academic sources we have, it's wiras. Wiria is more conjectural based on the IA, ya ending for uh, abstract nouns. Uh, likewise, baudi can be baudios, and that's usually what I use. Um, the, uh, I, well, never mind. Uh, we'll, we'll continue this when we get to the next slide. Um, the words that are closest to honor in the Western sense are enyequas and klutos. Klutos is, in fact, a term related to the verb to hear, and the word for ear, and it refers to what is heard about you. And yekwas is a term that literally means your face, also means your honor. Uh, when in English people talk about saving face, they're using a term for honor or reputation or esteem of others that is directly similar to an yekwas. It's a concept found in numerous cultures around the world. Uh, so with that, let's go to the next slide. Okay, virtues. 
before we launch into virtues, I want to point out these are the virtues that, well, let me give you some background. Let me dig out my some materials here. And uh, here we go. Um, the the following list of words for aspects of honor and virtues, in this case, the virtues, can you still hear me? Good. Um, it is the ultimate child of the virtues found in the uh, medieval Irish text, text Audacht Modain, as interpreted by Alexei Kondratiev when he posted his list of virtues to the Nemeton list back in the 90s. Um, I translated it into Gaulish using Delmar and Mat Matasovic's dictionaries. It also owes a lot to a list of virtues created by uh, a Celtic reconstructionist named Maya Sin Sinclair in the Gaulish polytheism community. It should be pointed out, however, that Maya is an Irish polytheist. Um, but she, in the early years of the Gaulish polytheist group on Facebook, she posted a list of virtues that tied into ideas I already had that I had gotten from Alexei Kondratiev, and he got it from Audach Morain. So that's where these come from. I should also point out that Bessos, uh, Bessos Nui Ogalation has their own spin on these virtues, as well as some additional ones of their own. Um, Artokatos is posting those online, and uh, those are also perfectly legitimate and perfectly fine. But this is my kind of original take on this stuff. Uh, from a few years back. Uh, so we have the word wiredos, which means virtue. We have the word wiroionos, wiroionos, which is just, fair, equitable, accurate, exact, true, rightful, appropriate, due, sound, apposite, and straightforward. We have rechtus, which is law and right. Um, law in the sense of law is enacted by a tribal assembly. And uh, in, in Gaul, unlike in ancient Ireland, tribal assemblies did enact laws uh, in the same way that governing bodies do in, in the West. Uh, uh, we have records of these laws, so, so we know they did. Uh, we don't have anything in Gaul like the, Bre the Brechen laws in Ireland. Uh, uh, but rechtus also means right, that which is right, and it does underscore that in all Celtic law systems that I know of, the law is a way of codifying and uh, making real the the right way of doing things. Woset um, la is firmness, calmness, and steadiness. It literally derives from words meaning under seat or firmly seated. Kowiriya, uh, which derives from with truth, is loyalty, sincerity, and good faith. Dilastos is firm loyalty. Oigetokariya, which literally translates as love of the guest, is guest friendliness, hospitality, and generosity. Inrechtus, which is rechtus preceded by in, which means in. Um, is integrity or inner rectitude. Next slide. Kom Somalia, which could also be Kob Somalia, is, or Ko Somalia for that matter, is even handedness, fairness, or impartiality. Uh, that's literally with the same. Welia is modesty and honesty. Uh, the concepts of honesty and modesty go together in most Celtic languages. There's a word for sincerity in uh, sincerity and humility in Irish, makanta, which means to be like a son and uh, like a young son, in other words. Uh, and uh, these uh, the, these words convey the idea of being humble and honest at the same time. Gala is valor, courage, ability. It also means warrior rage, so take that with however much caution you wish. Trago love of the suffering is what that literally means, compassion or pity. Wariya is duty, and wisus is knowledge which you need to determine right from wrong in the first place. Next slide. 
ideas of fate, tonknaman, were inherently related to the verb tonket, he, she, or its swears. The essence of this is that fate was that which is sworn, while to swear was to destine. This leaves open who was doing the swearing. From other evidence, we can probably conjecture that it was most likely Lugas and Rosmerta, though it will be discussed further. That will be discussed further in the cha chapter on deities and spirits. So we have Tonknaman, meaning fate, destiny, that which is sworn. And there's also a wonderful term, Watus, which is the uh, divine force of prophecy, divination, and poetic inspiration. Uh, is directly cognate to the uh, Germanic wode, uh, maybe a loan word, I'm not sure, uh, from Celtic into Germanic, from Gaulish into Germanic. Uh, next slide. Okay, now we start talking about the day wife, the gods. Note that the way I spell it on this slide and the way I spell it in the book are different, and it doesn't matter which particularly way you spell it. For some reason, I had an aesthetic liking for this spelling today. So um, we need to standardize our orthography, and I'm not sure which way to go. Uh, the nature of the gods. The gods are by far the best known part of Gaulish polytheism. We have a vast corpus of Latin inscriptions that give us the names of numerous divinities worshipped by Gauls, and a much smaller corpus of Gaulish language inscriptions, sometimes to the same deities. We have representations of the gods, symbols, which can make meaning symbols, sometimes in purely understandable settings, sometimes paired with classical Greco-Roman symbols or, or images, which can make meanings clearer. We have literary figures in other Celtic languages and deities in other Indo-European languages that can allow us to make inferences about their natures. Even so, not everything is known. They are mysterious, and personal experience with them is needed to truly understand them. Um, the word Dewas or Dewa, the word for god or goddess, is derived from the Proto-Indo-European Dewas, meaning god, but also having connotations of shining ones and celestial ones. The general idea is of a shining being of light. While the earliest term select suggests a celestial nature already by the time of the earliest inscriptions in sanctuaries, in fact, based on uh, sanctuary evidence without inscriptions in them, we can say already by the Bronze Age, uh, by the Urnfield period at, the, at the, the latest, offerings are being put into pits and shafts, suggesting that the term came to be applied to underworld beings as well. It needs to be noted that deities are not perfect. Deity, perfect beings are in fact capable of making mistakes and doing wrong. Uh, that uh, marks a clear distinction between our gods and the Christian god. Uh, the Christian god, in fact, suffers from what could be described as a bad definition problem. This doesn't mean that the Christian god doesn't exist, but that the definitions used by a lot of people for the Christian god don't actually work. You can't describe an indescribable being. You can't talk about an ineffable being. You, a being that is perfect is perfectly there and perfectly not there, perfectly powerful and perfectly weak, perfectly knowledgeable and perfectly ignorant. It doesn't work. Our gods are explicable in real-world terms as being very, great, very good, very powerful, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but they are not perfect, and therefore they are not self-contradictory. While vastly more powerful and better than human beings, they are nevertheless of a similar nature to us. There is no clear demarcation between gods and lesser spirits for the most part either. The term can be applied to a vast range of supernatural beings. Divine names are mostly descriptive epithets that tell us something about the particular deity in question. Thus we have Rosmerta, the good provider, or Sikelis, the good striker, or Taranis, thunder, and so on. We don't have true names of our gods in the ceremonial magic sense. Names do provide clues about the nature of deity that may be used in meditation or ritual to connect with them. Uh, the greatest source for linkage to the true nature of our gods comes from consideration of their symbols. It is really in the realm of symbolism that the most important truths about the divine nature are conveyed. It must be pointed out that a given deity's weapons or treasures are not possessions in the usual human sense. Rather, they are expressions of that god or goddess's inner essence, 
less a property than a part of the less property, less a, a piece of property than a part of the deity, of the deity expressing profound truths about him or her. The symbols speak directly to the unconscious. What's happened? Uh, my stream has ended. I, I don't see the slides anymore. No. Okay, hold on just a minute. I'm going to disconnect and reconnect. Okay, there. Now, how do I get the... Let me... Let me... Uh, see if... No. I can't get to it. I don't know where it is. I did. Oh, here we go. Got it. Let me go to watch stream. Okay. Let me go back to divine symbols and iconography where I got interrupted as things crashed here. Um, by meditate, okay. Uh, the symbols speak directly to the unconscious mind um, and so can tune us in, so to speak, to the energy, the feel, the essence of a divine being. By meditating on the symbols of the gods and how these symbols relate to one another, we can bring the religion into our souls. Next slide, please. Let's start with epona, or epona, the correct, that's the rigidly correct pronunciation. Uh, meaning of the name, scholars give various translations of her name, all pretty similar. Olmsted translates it as horse goddess. Green derives it from the word for horse. Kondratiev translates it as great mare. Nantanos Aidui, who is also known as Kefal Aidui of epona.net, translates it as divine mare, or she who is like a mare. MacKillop gives us divine horse or horse goddess. Iconography, ep ep epona is depicted in two main ways, side saddle mounted and seated between two horses. She is also occasionally shown in a cart. When depicted side saddle, she is shown wearing a long gown, often with a cloak. She often holds a cornucopia, patera, which is a Roman style offering bowl, or a basket of fruits. She is often also depicted with a dog, a key, a foal, or a mappa, which is a white cloth. Significance. Kondratiev identifies her with Mari Lud, which is the gray Mary or gray mare, a sort of hobby horse who is taken around by mummers during the Christmas season. From this, he interprets her as the sovereignty goddess, the land goddess, the mother of the child of light, which is Mappinus in his view, he identifies her with the winter, but also sees her as a goddess of fertility and plenty. Kaiser Sereth sees her Indo-European equivalent, Hechlona, as a horse and sovereignty goddess as well, but also sees her as possessing associations with unta untamed sexuality and a pure power which is potentially dangerous. The Italian scholar Carlo Ginzburg sees her as the uh, prototype of the later deity of the medieval Diana cults and as such leader of the wild hunt, something that fits with Kondratiev's identification of her with the Mari Lud. The, writers of, uh, the writer of epona.net, Kefal Aidui, is generally not willing to go so far, seeing all such elaborate theologies as unproven. 
Morpheus Ravenna, who is in here, I see, um, in her book, Book of the Great Queen, sees her as a sovereignty goddess more or less directly cognate to the Irish Macha or Roe, sharing even by, by names with Macha and, like her, possessing martial and fertility attributes as well as the aforementioned sovereignty function. She sees some of the differences between the Gaulish and Irish figures as due to the effects of Romanization in emphasizing the less martial attributes of an existing goddess. That is not going on anything Morpheus has told me recently. That's going on her book, which is some years old now. So that's not current information. Uh, next slide. Taranis, uh, meaning of the name, pretty much all authorities are agreed the name means thunder. Iconography, the most important symbols of Taranis are the thunderbolt and the wheel, which he often bears as a shield. Kevin Jones has performed a useful analysis of the Celtic wheel symbol in his dissertation, a consideration of the iconography of Romano-Celtic religion with respect to archaic elements of Celtic mythology. According to Jones, uh, Celtic wheels come with various numbers of spokes, but the highest numbers statistically have four, six, eight, and 12 spokes. We've got a little bit where it's 247, so I think there's time to uh, give you the meaning of those different numbers of spokes in uh, Kevin Jones's article, Joan Jones's, Jones, Jones's article. Uh, four spokes refer to the four directions, north, south, east, and west. Six spokes refer to the four directions plus up and down. Eight spokes refer to the four directions plus the four cross quarter directions, uh, north, west, southeast, northwest, northeast, southwest, southeast. Um, Twelve refer to the numbers of months in a typical year. In a lunar calendar, of course, you can have months with 13, you can have years with 13 months, but most months are still most years are still 12-month years. Sorry about that. I'm confusing months and years in my talking here. Jones is able to use this distribution to get at the meaning of the different wheels, showing that the Celtic wheel symbol is a symbol of the turning heavens and therefore of cosmic law and truth. So significance. Taranis is the sky father and the thunder god. As Jones shows us, he is the protector of cosmic law and of the cosmos itself. He represents truth and virtue, which were conceived of as a kind of fiery power. The Jupiter giant columns, a kind of Romano-Gaulish monument found in the Rhineland, show us a kind of dragon slayer myth in which Taranis kills a giant, often depicted with serpents for arms and legs. I should quick point out here that uh, since I wrote this, I have been able, I found that the uh, Jupiter giant columns, in fact, reflect certain existing Roman monuments uh, depicting the combat between Jupiter and Typhon, who was a symbol of chaos and, and a giant serpent. Uh, however, the Jupiter giant columns in the Rhineland still have native elements, notably that Jupiter is mounted, notably that Jupiter bears the wheel as a shield, and that the that Typhon is depicted as a giant with serpent arms and legs, at least as often as depicted as a serpent as such, or as a dragon. So I think we can say we had a fusion between a native myth that previously existed and a uh, Roman myth. Uh, Calvert Watkins, in his seminal book on Indo-European poetry and dragon slayer myths, How to Kill a Dragon, Aspects of Indo-European Poetics, unpacks the Indo-European versions of this myth and lets us see its elements. He is also able in an appendix to present one Irish version of the myth that gives us a good idea what the Gaulish myth must have looked like. From this, it is possible to see that the myth represented the victory of order over chaos, truth over falsehood, the upper world over the underworld, samas over gyamas, and so on. Given its representation in the form of great monuments, it was clearly a myth of central importance in understanding the Gaulish soul, at least in the Rhineland, particularly. Uh, so there we have Taranis. Next slide, please. Rasmerta, Rasmerta, uh, meaning of the name, there is no scholarly consensus. Green translates her name as Great Provider, as does MacKillop. 
that's James McKillop in the Oxford uh, Book of Celtic Mythology or Kel Oxford Book of Celtic Myth and Legend. It's it's a dictionary of Celtic myth and legend, and is very good. It includes a lot of continental material as well as a lot of uh, Irish and Welsh and so on material. Uh, Olmsted, Garrett Olmsted in Gods of the Celts and Indo-Europeans, which is a book that's good for determining what monuments were made to which god, which place, but is extremely questionable in terms of Olmsted's interpretations of things. Olmsted, on the other hand, translates her name as the highly foresighted. Michael Enright, in his book, um, Lady with a Mead Cup, uh, which is a book on uh, Celtic and Germanic warband culture, uh, it's something like war ritual and or, ritual and prophecy in the European war band from Latin to the Iron Age, from Latin to the Viking Age, I believe is the subtitle. Uh, he sees it slightly differently, emphasizing or translates it as great prophetess. Iconography, Green sees the, her iconography in terms of a wooden iron bound bucket with ladle, torches, patera, and cornucopia. Enright sees it slightly differently, emphasizing the wine bucket, cornucopia, and the weaver's bee. Significance. According to Enright, Rasmerta denotes fertility, fate, or both. He connects with the Matres and sees her as a goddess of fate and prophecy. Through her connection with a, of a, her, through her patronage of a Cirrus, termed a Welita, who was later used by ambitious continental Celtic and Germanic rulers to give legitimacy to their rule, she is connected with sovereignty and with warband culture. In this role, Rasmarta was queen. She was associated with a complex of related ideas encompassing women, liquor, feasting, and sovereignty, sexuality, and weaving. Through her role as a mead, mead goddess, Noemi Beck, in her uh, goddesses in Celtic religion, let me get this here. Uh, here it is goddesses in celtic religion cult and mythology a comparative study of ancient ireland britain and gaul which is a thesis at the university of Lyon and can be obtained on their website um she sees her as a spiritual initiator Krista Ovist, in her, her uh, dissertation, which is entitled, uh, let me see. Here we go. Integration of Mercury and Lugus, Myth and History in Late Iron Age and Early Roman Gaul. Uh, that can also be obtained on the web. Uh, sees her a little differently. She states that the Rosmarta's name and plastic representations suggest the accumulation, transformation, and recirculation of related manifestations of value. She sees her as a goddess of sovereignty as well as terrestrial plenty, which she associates with the sack or bag found in her cult as well as that of the Gaulish Mercury. Uh, I should quickly point out that the Rosmarta and the Gaulish Mercury were a divine couple shown together. Whether this means they were romantically linked or whether they were mother and son or something of this kind is not known. Next slide, please. Lugus. I am going to hasten to point out that my use of the term Lugus for the Gaulish Mercury here is somewhat controversial. Uh, that there were numerous Gaulish Mercuries worshipped by various tribes is clear, that there were numerous names for a deity who we can call the Gaulish Mercury perhaps is another way of putting it. We don't know really which. Uh, it is suggested by the evidence whether that name was secretly Lugus, which is only found in a few place names and on the, in, in Spain and in uh, the British, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Isles, the Dorn, Great Britain and Ireland. Um, whether uh, the uh, the uh, name was in, in fact Lugus is, is open to debate. 
but I'm using the term here because I, I think it is more likely it was a taboo name and, and doesn't find itself in worship for that reason. Uh, meaning of the name, Kondratiev gives us lightning flash. Green suggests shining one. Olmsted suggests bright or else god of oaths. McKillop suggests raven. Olmsted is supported by John Koch in his article on the subject, who presents a strong argument not only for the name meaning oath, but for Lugus being a deity of oaths and destinies necessary to the cohesion of early Celtic society. Iconography. Kondratiev uh, gives us the spear, raven, horse, lynx, and wren, as well as high places and tricephaly. The Greco-Roman iconography of Mercury, especially the sack, is also important. Significance. Kondratiev regards Lugus as the master of all the arts, a god of many skills, much as in the Irish myth. Uh, Kondratiev also presents a complex analysis of Irish myth in which he interprets Lugus as the killer of a giant, much like the Irish Balor, by which act he wins the harvest from the control of the chaotic nature spirits. According to his analysis, the Spear of Lu, Spear of Lu yeah, in Irish myth, represents the lightning bolt visible in the storms of autumn, which end the hot weather in time for the harvest. Michael Enright sees Lugus quite differently, regarding him as a mysterious figure linked with fertility, seasonal change, and the underworld. He presents an interesting list of, list of characteristics of features of figures linked to Mercury among the Gauls and Celtiberians. One Iodnest, raven as cult animal, I'm quoting now, one, one Iodnest, raven as cult animal, uh, Spear-bearing prophet stabbed by a spear, sacrificed by hanging and stabbing, disguised appearance, dedication of a hostile force by a spear throw, leadership of a band of warriors sworn to die for him, association of a, with a prophetess with ties to the cult of the dead, unquote. The links of this picture with the Germanic Woden should be obvious. Ovis sees, sees Lugus in still different but related terms as the stranger king, who comes to the gods from a mixed parentage and who overthrows a tyrannical, overthrows and kills a tyrannical giant, uh, thereby winning freedom for his people. She also sees him as a god of art or skill. There are obvious commonalities to all three images, the mysterious nature of Lugus, his patronage of art or skill, his use of a spear, his use of it to kill a giant, associations with ravens, prophecy, and war. It should be noted that Lugus is definitely part of a, well, the, the Gaulish Mercury is definitely a part of a divine couple with Rosmerta, who in both Enright's and Ovist's view has associations with uh, prophecy. Um, Daniel Gishenson, in his Apollo the Wolf God, never mentions Lugus, but it ha in his, has in his Wind Wolf a deity associated with wind and breath, harvest, weather, death, wolves, and the leadership of the war band, a young, a band of young unmarried warriors sworn to his worship, and that of other warrior deities. John Koch sees Lugas above all as, a, as the oath made manifest, the protector of the sworn word and of the social ties that come from oaths. Insofar as the word for oath is related to the word for destiny, Lugus is the deity of destiny as well, swearing destinies on all things in cooperation with Rasmerta. To give a little bit more substance to that, in my view, that this is me talking now, this isn't, I'm not quoting another scholar on this, but as I see it, um, Rasmerta weaves destiny with the weaver's beam and bears the cup of mead to Lugus, who swears destiny over the cup of mead. Uh, you can take that with however many grains of salt you wish, because that's just me speculating, basically, or, or interpreting. Uh, I can't even call that unverified personal gnosis, because that's me reasoning out or intuiting out from the evidence at our disposal. Uh, so... Uh, the matres, uh, matronae, also play a big role in destiny as well, as we will see. Uh, that's about all for that. And uh, next slide, please. Katu Baudois, meaning of the name, Olmsted translates the name as Battle Crow. MacKillop translates it similarly, Raven of Battle. Uh, 
I should point out in discussing the name that Ka du Baudois is a direct cognate to the Irish Bai of Ka, and, uh, which also means battle crow or battle raven. Battle crow, I believe. Uh, actually, I'm not sure. Um, iconography, no depictions are known. From the name and association with the Bai of Ka, we can be sure she was associated with crows or ravens, especially three crows or ravens. Significance, above all else, Katabodois is the goddess of war and battle. She serves up conflict, prophecies about battle, and incites warriors. She is of a consistently violent nature, delighting in death, conflict, and woe. She is intimately connected with heroes, helping train them, inspire them, and bringing about their deaths in a suitable fashion. She uses and enjoys war poetry. Despite her essential harshness, she is not a demonic being as such, but rather the defined personification of war. Uh, Morpheus Ravenna, in the book of the Great Queen, again, this, this is old information, sees her under several names, notably Baudaga and Cassibodwa, as a bringer of victory, war goddess, and chooser of the slain, directly cognate to the Irish Baivka, and also possessing many Germ early Germanic equivalents. Next slide, please. Cumulus, meaning of name, Olmsted gives us of conflicts and the warrior. Green has no suggestions. McKillop says powerful. None of them are remotely certain of their etymologies. Iconography, Green shows that horses, horsemen, and infantry, sometimes with shields, sometimes with severed heads, are associated with several by names of this god or related deities. McKillop mentions that he is ramhorn. Significance, Kondratiev says of an equivalent of him that he is the god who sets the boundaries of the civilized world and protects them by force of arms. Thus he is god of the defense of the tribe, of war, and of warriors. He is also a god of boundaries and borders, and by this as well as his association with Mars, can be linked to fields and to agriculture. Next slide. Nanto Suelta. Meaning of name, green suggests winding river or meandering brook. Olmsted suggests sun-warmed valley or she who makes the valley bloom. Iconography, green sees her iconography in terms of a patera, a house on a pole, a raven or other bird, a pot, a cornucopia, and wine barrels. Olmsted sees her iconography in similar terms, ola, which is a Roman version of a pot, uh, purse and bird, house on a pole, raven, and cornucopia. Significance, Olmsted she sees Nanto Suelta as goddess of the underworld, particularly in its role as a Celtic Elysium, the underworld paradise. My own work with her suggests this role as well, but also patronage of fertility, wealth, wine, and the kind of wisdom that comes from the underworld. Morpheus Ravenna, in the Book of the Great Queen, again, old information, sees her as a river goddess associated with fertility, land, wisdom, and funerary qualities, associated with a tribal father, father god whose attributes include warlike and sustaining elements. I'm not meaning to keep identifying old information there, but I'm not meaning to put words into the mouth of somebody who's actually present for this uh, presentation. I uh, am going on research in, in a book that was written some years ago. Uh, next slide, please. Spikellus, meaning of name, all major authorities are agreed on good striker. Iconography, the long-shafted mallet and pot, wine and barrels, and ola and a dog. Olmsted has, no, has noticed the striking similarity of Sikelis's iconography to that of the Etruscan underworld deity Charon. This resemblance forms one key to understanding Sikelis. Significance, Sikelis is god of the underworld, though not necessarily lord of the dead. His iconography, modeled on the Etruscan Charon, confirms this, as does his association with Dispater. He is also a deity of wealth, fertility, and plenty, as shown by his pot, ola, and wine symbolism. That wine symbolism makes him the deity of grapes, vine growing, and of wine itself. Although an underworld deity, he is, unlike Karun, a basically benevolent figure associated with the pleasures of life and the afterworld paradise. He is paired with Nanto Svelta. Next slide, please. Kernunos. Meaning of name. Kaiser, Sereth, and Kondratiev both give us the god with antlers. 
Green disagrees slightly translating his name as Horned One or Peaked One. Iconography, Green describes his iconography as antlers, stags, the ram horn, ram horn snake, torques, a sack of grain and or money, and a rat. Sarath, in his article, Kernunos Looking a Different Way, disputes this to some degree, arguing that the context of the ram, ram, ram horned serpent may suggest that it is a generic monster. Sarath further suggests that sitting between the serpent and the torque may represent Kernunos as a mediator between opposites. Likewise, he suggests that the, the, suggests that the depiction of Kernunos on the Rem's altar, showing him between a stag and a bull, may represent his mediation between the wild and the civilized. Significance, Sarath, in his extensively documented and closely reasoned article, sees Kernunos as a mediator between opposites, a god of bi-directionality and exchange, reciprocity and ambiguity. In this view, Kernunos mediates between upper world and underworld, samas and gyamas, wild and civilized, good and evil, light and darkness. As such, he is a god of agreements, contracts, merchants, and travelers. I also see him myself as a god of communication, an opener of the way who can be invoked to bear prayers to the other gods, as well as a psychopomp, a god of the guide of the dead. He may be able to function as a spiritual initiator as well. Kondratiev in the Apple Branch adds to this an elaborate seasonal mythology in which Skernino stands for the Gyamos principle. I personally don't find uh, Kondratiev's elaborate mythology of Kernunos particularly convincing, but you may differ in that if you read it. Uh, Phyllis Frey Bober, in her 1951 article, Kernunos, Origin and Transformation of a Celtic Divinity, argues that Kernunos is in fact Dispater, and that the that is in fact is Pater, the Celtic lord of the underworld and the dead. Certainly, this would be in keeping with Kernunos's role as a psychopomp. Despite this, I think I find uh, Kaiser Sarath's article to be the most convincing treatment of Kernunos so far. Next slide, please. Tirana, meaning of name. There are two main schools of thought. Green argues that the name is etymologically related to star. In this, she is supported by MacKillop, who translates the name as divine star. Olmsted, on the other hand, argues for the meaning of the heifer. Uh, iconography. Olmsted describes her iconography as cow or cattle, which explains his connection of the name. Serpent and patera. patera. Green describes it slightly differently. Diadem, eggs, serpent, and springs. Some authorities also mention a star symbol in one inscription. Significance, Tirana is the goddess of the night sky, wells, serpents, and healing. Now, I uh, reasoned from her identification with Diana in one inscription, uh, I believe it was near Munich or Augsburg, um, and also from Derek Smythe's identification of the Irish Boan with the moon in his Guide to Irish Mythology, that she might also be the moon goddess with associations with time tides in the calendar. I don't think a lot of people have bought into that. I, I certainly treat her as such, but I'm not sure anybody else does. Uh, so you can take that with however many grains of salt you wish. Uh, next slide, please. Grunus, uh, meaning of name. Olmsted gives us God of Hot Springs, but has trouble justifying it. Green is not so optimistic, merely wanting to note that it uh, probably derives from the name of Grand in the Vosk. Iconography, Grunus was, Grunus was worshipped in typical Gallo-Roman healing shrines, often associated with, a heal with healing springs. He was associated with Apollo in those shrines. He is depicted with horses, a sun chariot, and on one occasion, the head of a radiant sun deity. Significance, reasoning from the above, we can see that Grunus is a solar deity, possibly god of the sun, certainly god of light. He is even more, he is a healing deity called on to cure injury and illness. He was also called on for health and protection. As a deity at once solar and watery, hot springs are especially sacred to him. Next slide, please. Brigantia, meaning of the name, Olmsted gives us the High One or the Exalted One. 
Kondratiev gives us the more complex but essentially similar. She who raises herself on high, who is exalted. McKillop gives us high one. Iconography, Jia is depicted as a typical Gallo, uh, I'm sorry, Romano Celtic Minerva with uh, shield, spear, and helmet. Uh, significance, the key to understanding Bregentia are her identification with the Indo European hearth goddess. And I'll warn you, this is controversial. This is something I do. It's not, not too many other people do this with the later Irish bridge. Bregentia is in origin the hearth goddess, but becomes identified with fire itself. In Ireland, she is the goddess of, well, her equivalent, Bridge, is the goddess of poetry, smithcraft, and healing, all of which are associated with spiritual fire or heat. These attributions all apply to her earlier Gaulish form to some extent. She is the goddess of the hearth fire, but also of heat, warmth, energy, purity, and protection. Her patron of the hearth gives her a role as a patron of the household as well. Noemi Beck in Goddesses in Celtic Religion, Cult and Mythology, a Comparative Study of Ancient Ireland, Britain, and Gaul, points out that Brig names are very often associated with highlands and highland sanctuaries, thus definitely proving her to be a goddess of high places, including mountains and hills. My own personal, never mind that. Uh, we'll stop with mountains and hills. Uh, as I've pointed out, other people have found reason to, to find fault with my identification of her with the Irish bridge. So we can definitely say high places, and I think we can definitely say fire and light, uh, heat, and so forth, and energy. And we can go with the identification of her as a Minerva as being generally shared among Gaulish polytheists. It's an open question whether a lot of continental Gaulish Gaulish deities. Brigantia, the form Brigantia, is predominantly found in Britain, though there are a couple of inscriptions on the continent. Uh, there are also deities with the Brig suffix like Brigindana, Brigana, and so forth. Uh, and uh, it's an open question as to whether they are, in fact, the same divinity. I, I tend to think they probably are, but, uh, but a lot of people would disagree with me on that. Next slide, please. Okay, Agmeos. Meaning of the name, it is not known. Olmsted tentatively suggests a porter, uh, really tentatively. Iconography, the Roman poet Lucan describes Hercules depicted in Gaul with his classical lion skin and club, but as an old man drawing behind him a band of men attached to him by thin gold chains linking their ears to his tongue. Uh, significance, Ogmeos is the god of eloquence, but also of strength, a deity patronizing both intellectual and physical pursuits. He is, however, a deity often invoked in Gallo-Roman cursing tablets, which make it clear that he was, he was not a servant of the Chthonic gods, he was a Chthonic god, with a dark and dangerous aspect. Um, I would point out here that a number of people, uh, both in uh, Bessus, uh, Senebesus Bolgon, as well as in uh, Bessus Nuio Galation, um, have uh, uh, put forth the idea that Ogmios is, uh, in fact, an ancestor deity to to the Gauls, uh, based on uh, Greco-Roman accounts of Hercules. Uh, in his various travels around the world, fathering figures who became ancestors of, of the Gauls and of Gaulish tribes. And the, the more I look at that, the more convincing I find it. I, I'm not 100% convinced yet, but I think that there is something fruitful there and it's well worth pursuing. If so, that would explain why Ogmeos is shown as an old man in Gaul and it would explain why Ogmeos is associated as an underworld divinity, because he is, in fact, an ancestor. Next slide, please. Silas, meaning of name, both Olmsted and MacKillop assert that the name means either I or son or both. Green is content to say that the name is linked philologically with the sun. Iconography, Silas is depicted as a typical Romano-Celtic Minerva, she is famously worshipped in the healing shrine at Aquae Sulis, modern Bath, England. 
its significance, Solis is the Sun Maiden and also a major healer. As another deity of fire and water, hot springs are associated with her. It should be noted that inscriptions to her are very largely found in Britain. It is possible that she is a British deity and that she was not known on the continent. Um, the, I'm going to digress here a little bit. The question as to whether she was known on the continent comes down to interpretation of a triad of divinities called the Silewii, who are found particularly in Iberia, in what's now Spain. Uh, they are deities similar to the Matres or the Matroni, um, and the name Silewii has been linked to Sulis etymologically, but there are other etymologies that do not derive the name from Sulis, and it is not clear which etymology is correct. And depending on which etymology eventually wins out in the scholarly debate, that will determine whether or not Sulis is found on the continent. Um, if she is not found on the continent, that would suggest that the ancient British had a sun maiden, Sulis, while the continental Gauls had a sun god, Grunus. Conversely, if she is found on the continent, it would simply mean that there was a sun, sun goddess and a sun god, which shouldn't be too surprising because a lot of cultures have both. Um, next slide, please. Mopinus, meaning of the name, in a rare burst of humor, Kondratiev writes that the name Mopinus meant superboy, essentially. Uh, green is more pedestrian, translating the name as divine youth or divine son. Makilla gives us great son. Iconography, he has shown us several guides. In one inscription, he appears as Apollo the Scythra player. In another, he is shown with a hunting goddess. He also has healing springs associated with him. Um, significance, Mopinus is a god of youth, as his name suggests. He appears to have associations with hunting. The Shemalier inscription suggests that he is primarily an underworld figure who could be invoked for magic. The story of Mabinup Modron gives us an elaborate story of his birth, in which Mabinup Modron is born to a goddess who is Modron, who may be identifiable with Epina, but then disappears on the third day after his birth. The gods search for him during the search, they are advised by a stag, a boar, an eagle, and finally a salmon. The salmon tells them where to find him in the underworld, and so he is rescued and returned to the gods. Kondratiev regarded him as an, in addition to this, I, I got most of the identification of Mabin and, and Mopinus and that myth itself from Kondratiev. Um, Kondratiev also has further dying and reborn god mythology associated with Mopinus which has him born every year at the winter solstice and dying every autumn, thus personifying the uh, cycle of the year. I think that's going too far. I think that's, uh, that's reading into him elements that are, that are not necessarily justified. Um, Christopher Tom Scott Thompson, the uh, scholar of, uh, this was in conversations in the Gaulish Polytheism group on Facebook. Uh, Christopher Scott Thompson, the uh, scholar of, uh, Celtic martial arts, uh, particularly Scottish martial arts, suggested that Mopinus might be an intermediary between uh, humans and a class of unpleasant underworld spirits known as the Underoi uh, because he was raised in the underworld. I haven't tested that yet, so I can't say for sure if there's any truth to it, but I find it intriguing. And uh, when I get some guts up to test it, I will, but that's, that's a very dangerous undertaking, and so I haven't done that yet. Um, next slide, please. Tautatis, tribal deities. Many ancient writers appear to refer to a deity named variously Tautatis, Tautates or Tutates, Tutanus, Tautiorichs, and so on. The deity, often called a war god, is variously identified with Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, and Apollo. In fact, the term Tautatis in the plural, Tautatis in the plural, refers to the deities of tribes and localities. Tribal cults were ubiquitous in ancient Gaul. Every tribe and locality had one, though not all are known today. Indeed, of the 400 plus known Gaulish deity names, more than 300 occur only once. Um, let me point out something about uh, uh, Gaulish grammar here. The, the singular form of the name Tautatis is uh, 
an I stem um, and an is ending. As such, it is uh, conceivably, um, it, it's, it's a male or female ending. It, it can mean he or she um, or it. It, it can be neuter as well. It can be inclusive neuter. It, that's how I treat it. It, it means any gender. And uh, as such, um, I've incorporated tribal goddesses into the category of Tautatis as well. I decided a separate category for Tauta de Was, which I put in my book, was gender essentialist, and I've eliminated that category in my current practice. Uh, Given that the term is is in fact an inclusive neuter, it can mean male or female, I see no reason not to have a single category for all tribal deities, especially because the more I learn about uh, uh, local deities, the more I find that some of the modern scholars' theories of all, all river deities being goddesses and all tribal ancestor deities being gods are simply not true. Uh, we have plenty of river gods and we have plenty of uh, tribal ancestors who were female and uh, there's no reason to, to limit our deities in that way. Uh, next slide please. Matres or matronae. The matres are an important type of female local or tribal deity found across the Gaulish speaking world. Their iconography is distinct, and so they must be treated as different from the other types of local goddess. This iconography suggests that they had connections to fertility, plenty, and fate. Some modern Germanic heathens treat them as related to the Germanic Edesa, deified female ancestors, and I think there may be something to this, though it doesn't appear to, though it doesn't appear to work in all cases. According to Green, they are depicted in groups of three with, quote, long garments, sometimes with one breast bared, accompanied by symbols of fertility, babies, older children, fruit, bread, corn, or other motifs of plenty, close quote. They are also shown with spindles, suggesting the link to both spinning and fate. Uh, in the Rhineland, they are called by the Latin term matronae, and their iconography is distinctive. According to Green, quote, the matronae or the Rhineland are distinctive in that their iconography almost invariably shows a pattern of two mature goddesses, wearing huge linen bonnets flanking a younger girl with long flowing hair, unquote. According to Olmsted, there were matres of Roman provinces, individual tribes and regions, districts within tribes and regions, villages and settlements and localities. Um, there are also matronae who are, are, uh, or matres who are associated with uh, functions and uh, there are some who are seemingly all-encompassing. Uh, the, the matres olotautes are the mothers of all tribes, is, is how that literally translates, or mothers of great tribes, depending on how you translate olo uh, in Gaulish. Uh, uh, River Devora is the polytheist community's leading expert on the matronae, and I recommend her articles on the topic. I don't have the names of them with me at the moment. She also has given presentations on them, which can give much better information than I can. Uh, next slide. Dusioi, destructive forest spirits rather similar to the Greco-Roman satyrs. The Dusioi caused damage to orchards and crops and came to sleeping women in at night having sex with them in the manner of an incubus. Uh, based on that, information, Dusioi are a form of demonic or evil spirit. Unfortunately, in the uh, Gaulish lore of lesser spirits that have survived to the present day, we don't have, or that are known at the present day, they haven't survived in folklore, we don't have a lot of information about the nicer spirits. Those seem to have been forgotten, but the nasty ones seem to have been remembered. Uh, next slide, please. Underoi, a uh, term meaning those below, this is an attested term for the spirits of the underworld. Exactly who they are is unclear. From the Shemalia inscription, we know that their magic was well known in some way. They were included, that they included the spirits of the dead is likely. My own experience with them suggests that they are unpleasant, including a variety of other spirits.
spirits of mischievous or malevolent nature dwelling in the underworld. In modern Celtic fol folklore, the line between the spirits of the dead and the mound dwellers is often very blurred, to say the least. Um, some years back at Samhain, I made the mistake of going out in the front yard and making an offering to the underoi. And uh, I did it on impulse, and I don't know why I was so reckless. We had at our home paranormal phenomena coming out our ears for months. We had voices whispering unintelligibly in empty rooms. We had footsteps sounding in the night and during the day. We had footsteps sounding loudly, stomping on the roof. Well, we tried everything we could to get rid of it. It didn't help. Uh, f nothing else happened that we were aware of. Um, but uh, three months later, um, at about the winter solstice, the phenomena went away on its own. I don't recommend you call on the underoi, at least not without some sort of protection or mediation. 